Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for uh, the NAC at Home program. My name is Gordon Kendall. I am a member of the Fashion Committee. And let me start with a big shout out to my fellow members on the Fashion Committee who uh, work to help make this uh, program possible as well. I know many of you are, so thank you. Um, I know many of you are familiar with National Arts Club, but if uh, you're not familiar with us, if this is new uh, to you and your first time, welcome. And just a little information about the club itself. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City uh, with a stated mission um, to stimulate, foster, promote the public interest in the arts and educate the American people in the fine arts, as the uh, as our preamble as our preamble says. What that means is annually the club offers more than 550 free programs such as this one um, to the public, uh, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, readings, fashion, fashion committee presentations. Um, for more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at National Arts Club, all one word, nationalartsclub.org. And as we, we're on all the socials, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. And by the way, the, um, this program will be available later on YouTube uh, if you'd like to see it again or like to see any of the other programs that we have had. Uh, as well, at the end of this program, there will be a link in the chat box um, that you can follow to purchase the book that we are going to talk about today, Dressing Barbie. There we go. And let me just say, if you are looking for a fun, colorful book right now, as the winter and season starts, um, either for yourself or for a, a gift, this is just an incredible, not just walk down memory lane, but really just an incredible look at pop culture. And I don't want to take anything away from our, our guest and what she will say about it because she, she, was, she was part of it. She was uh, the, uh, the creative mind behind Dressing Barbie. But let me say there are all kinds of fun tidbits, facts of information about the 60s, 70s, and 80s apart from fashion that are very fascinating. So whether you're interested in fashion or pop culture, or you just want a good escape, <laughs> this is a fun book to do it. Very, very fun book today. And so with that said, today we're joined by Carol Spencer, the author of Dressing Barbie, who worked for several years as a fashion designer and illustrator in the apparel industry before beginning her career at Mattel in 1963 as the fashion designer for Barbie. Um, in that role, Carol had created thousands of fashions for the iconic doll and watched really as Mattel grew from a small business to the international um, multinational conglomerate that we know. And she records much of that in her book. It's very fascinating to read because up to, up to then, I had really only known Mattel just from seeing the boxes. I didn't know anything about the history. And I think there's a lot of really fascinating insight about that corporation, that business, and how it really captured the public imagination. So that said, Carol traveled from the Paris fashion shows to running the Hong Kong design group in the 1980s. She's literally been around the world with Barbie and will share that with you in her presentation. Um, she retired in 1998 and lives in um, Los Angeles. And you will see, uh, I think, in, in this uh, part of her impressive collection of Barbies that she has not only amassed over the years, but she, she's designed for uh, over the years and helped create the image that we know of as Barbie. So without further ado, I would love to turn this over to Carol Spencer and her great presentation on Dressing Barbie. Thanks.
Hello, it's exciting to be here with you via Zoom. And many thanks to HarperCollins and my agent Murray Weiss for introducing me to the National Arts Club and the members of the National Arts Club for inviting me to present my book, Dressing Barbie. Special thanks to Angela Liu for coordinating my presentation and to Mitch Case for advising me on Zoom PowerPoint technology. I'm honored by the invitation to talk to you today about my book, Dressing Barbie, that is both a memoir and a decades book on the Barbie doll. My story begins in the upper Midwest. It wasn't always easy, but it was fulfilling beyond my wildest dreams. I received many notes from readers who were influenced by the challenges mentioned in Dressing Barbie that I personally encountered. They are encouraged to achieve their dreams, especially during the year of COVID-19. My book is a bit of a memoir in the beginning and then details my contribution to Mattel's iconic Barbie doll. It explains how I persevered as a designer over the years and how my goal of designing Barbie fashions that were in tune with the times and today I'm proud to say that on June 5 of this year, I received the Costume Society of America's President's Award as a fashion influencer. I'm proud of this award and honored to present to you today my story. I dreamed of becoming a fashion designer while in high school when Christian Dior uh, lengthened skirts and cinched waists as I grew taller. Needing a new wardrobe, I began making my clothes or redesigning them. I never imagined while I learned about fashion at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design that I would spend over 35 years designing for a doll named Barbie, who was one-sixth the size of a live person. Later, while working at Mattel, I dreamed of writing a book about the Barbie doll and was able to get permission to fulfill this dream. I'm the only Mattel employee with a Mattel license authorized to write a book offering an inside view on the Barbie doll. Tonight, I will combine my dreams in this presentation of Dressing Barbie as I incorporate the art of designing for a toy doll who became an American icon. I grew up playing with baby dolls, many that drank and wet also paper dolls that I dearly loved. I would watch the Sunday newspaper with the latest paper doll to cut out and enjoy. I did not have many dolls as I was born during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Probably the reason I love paper dolls is I only recall having three dolls in my childhood and one calico cat that I took to bed with me nightly. When Barbie doll hit the market in 1959, children loved her, but buyers were skeptical. She had a complete wardrobe planned by Ruth Handler and designer Charlotte Johnson. Everything from sleepwear to evening wear, sport clothes to a casual sweater girl set. Barbie even had a tiny fish with a fishing pole and blue jeans. She could ski or swim but the most cherished and played with fashion was the wedding gown that graced the cover of the first catalog. As you can see in the picture, the fashions had to be not only attractive, fitting the Barbie doll perfectly, just like real clothes fit a person, but they also had to look appealing as they lay inside the package at the toy store. The first line of Barbie fashions were designed in the USA by Charlotte Johnson working with Ruth Handler's vision. The one exception was Gay Parisian. While having dinner one evening, during the year she spent in Japan living at the hotel designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and that would be Imperial Hotel too. As she worked with our licensee team, Kokusai Bawaki Kasha Limited, to locate fabrics and approve necessary changes for production, CJ, as we called her, saw a beautiful French lady arrive on the arm of a distinguished gentleman. And she was wearing this bubble-cut silk taffeta gown with a sumptuous white fur stole. 
Charlotte just had to replicate it for Barbie doll. In your upper left corner is Evening Splendor that was fabricated out of the fabric used on Japanese dolls for the Obies. And next to her is Commuter Set. And that's the fashion um, that we representing what women were uh, starting to do. They were starting to commute to various things at that time. Okay, all of these were presented to market at Toy Fair, February 1959. In the background is a picture that I personally shot at Mejimura Open Air Park in Japan near Kyoto, where the Japanese people preserved many of the earliest buildings built by foreigners. As the country grew and changed, the buildings had to change also. When Imperial Hotel 2 had to be demolished, Frank Lloyd Wright's wife lobbied to preserve his work, and portions of the hotel were moved to this park, brick by brick, and they actually serve food in that dining room. Barbie was introduced in 1959 and loved by children and parents immediately. Soon the world of Barbie enlarged with her friends and members of her family. Her boyfriend, Ken, came first, and then her best friend, Midge, then her younger sister, Skipper. Her friends and family grew for the first 40 years and slowly have disappeared in the 21st century as technology is changing play. I became a designer for the Barbie doll in April of 1963. I learned the plan for Barbie and her fashions very quickly. We were instructed to think of Barbie as a real person. All of her clothing had to be realistic in every detail. Initially, her waistline was reduced to allow for the thickness of three layers of fabric. That meant being careful to choose a thin but not fragile fabric. In the early years, we frequently used habutai a sturdy silk fabric, as well as rayon, tulle, and cotton fabrics. Nylon was plentiful as it had been used in parachutes during World War II. Polyesters, acrylics, and spandex were not developed until later in the 1960s. Wool felt we used for slippers or shoes, or a few shoes. We had to be extremely careful with white cotton fabrics, as most of the world favored a pure white or slightly yellowish white, while Japanese cotton often had a very purplish cast, making it look kind of dirty. The scale of every detail was important. We were to measure the width of a human face and the various widths of skirts a person would wear versus the width of Barbie doll's face and gear the size of her clothes accordingly. And the clothes had to fit, allowing flexibility for the latest lifelike features our engineers had developed and then look great on the doll also. The original play pattern for Barbie doll was the paper doll play pattern of dress up where the child pretended the dolls played various roles in her life. Uh, this is, in fact, the projection play pattern. Play value was my first consideration um, for every design I did for the Barbie doll. Subtle values were built in that allowed the child hours of fun. They might explore their future, their own creativity, or to understand interactions with friends and family. Along the way, the youngest child was able to gain dexterity, while older children learned about colors, combining and creating clothing, hairstyles, and makeup. The clothing and accessories guided the playtime, but the child fantasized. When children play, they often solve current problems and resolve conflicts, or dream and plan for the future. This is called role play, a form of free play that allows a full scope of imagination and creativity. It's part of the projection play pattern that Ruth Handler played planned for the Barbie doll. Elliot Handler wanted to expand the play value and introduce make and play where the child made the garment for her doll before playing dress up. 
It took almost two years to solve problems associated with the production. One problem had to do with safety. As it was not considered safe to use sharp objects such as needles or scissors, we needed fabric that could be cut with safety scissors. Also, we needed to find a type of printing color to form an edge that would keep the fabric from raveling. Along the way, 3M discovered sticky labels while perfecting glue strips for the child uh, to rub onto the seams and then uh, press them together. I cut the blue dress out of one of the initial prototype fabrics after scanning it for the book, and then I basted it together and dressed it on the correct doll so I could photograph it for the book. And these are three of the original so free uh, fashions. The Color Magic Dolls and Fashions were a wonderful success. This was another of Elliot Handler's ideas to add play value to both the doll and the fashions. This was a time when children would buy coloring books and apply water to see the picture. Hence the idea for color change or color magic. Children love to mix the solution, salt for one change and soda for the other. They were edible color changes just in case the child would put it in their mouth. They loved changing the colors of both Barbie doll's hair and her fashions. And today vintage collectors enjoy this 1960s line. This photo is the last photo I shot for dressing Barbie. When the editor who reorganized my book at Hopper Collins had copy without an accompanied photo, I quickly gathered the small swatches of original color magic fabric that I had and set up this photo, shooting it immediately after I drizzled color change liquid onto her hair, allowing it to splash onto her suit and fabric below. It took 16 years from the time I retired to locate a publisher, and I worked on my Barbie book for years before I met a well-known screenwriter through friends, and together we assembled a book proposal titled Barbie and Carol Behind the Pink Curtain of Secrecy, and presented it to our agents, two middle-aged men who had never played with Barbie. Well, let me tell you, they loved it. Then when HarperCollins Design Imprint Executive Editor a Barbie fan, agreed to publish the book, we were ecstatic. The screenwriter was to prepare an outline and complete the book per the new arrangement created by a HarperCollins editor when one of her prior documentaries needed the final version and she had to leave. HarperCollins would not allow me to write the final version as I'm basically not a writer. Therefore, I chose a ghostwriter skilled in fashion her name was Lori Brookins. Therefore, the screenwriter and I never got a chance to proceed with our dream of a TV documentary. I took a chance at, with HarperCollins and insisted that they use my new photography. And then I had to go through an approval process and was actually approved. I had taken fashion design and photography classes at MCAD, and much later photography classes from a protege of Ansel Adams. Therefore, I felt qualified to handle uh, the photography. This is my photo studio, and it was located on my driveway using natural sunlight under the shade of a tree a la Ansel Adams. I personally shot 42 new photos for dressing Barbie using a Sony 7R2 digital camera, open no mirrors, shooting in camera raw with a portrait lens. After HarperCollins qualified my photography for the book, up, for the, book um, the background photo paper had to be set up every morning as nighttime dampness would ruin the set. I was able to take three different photos each day as I groomed the dolls and fashions after transferring the digital photos to my computer and checking to be sure I had more than one good one each day. To prepare the doll to stand by herself, I used 
8 or 11 or 12 inch long upholstery needles and hot glued them to the back of her legs. They extended well below her feet so they could be pushed into thick styrofoam base that was covered by the four foot wide photo paper background. As my photo studio was outside, normally with a slight breeze, I had to watch that her hair would not blow a strand or two over her face and ruin the photo. Mattel shot several new photos for the book in their studio and then offered to allow me to use one of their photo studio sets if I paid for the photographer and stylist, achieving around eight new photos per day at $2,500. I feared I would not break even on the book at that rate. Therefore, with my natural light photo studio and my styling skills, I personally began shooting photos after I qualified. My first job as a designer out of college was in ladies' lingerie, where I designed a great many boudoir fashions for women. Therefore, it was natural that I design undergarments for Barbie in the 1960s. As we entered the 60s, women still wore nylon stockings with garters. And if you look carefully at the Brudan American Girl doll in the center, you'll see how I wound thin copper wire to form a garter using a tiny shank button for the nubbin beneath. This doll is a prototype the very first fashion created and dressed on the doll. When it was approved for the line, the male engineers loved looking at the doll as they designed the final garter. They thought she was quite sexy at the time. Slowly, women's fashion changed to panty girdles and bras, and then into pantyhose. And that all took place in the 1960s and pantyhose remains popular today, especially in cold climates. Barbie's cousin Francie wore mod fashions perfectly. She was a bit smaller than Barbie doll, and buyers were frequently confused between the two dolls. At one time, fashions for Barbie stated that they fit both dolls. The Francie doll looked great in the mod fashions, as she was petite, lacking in the curves that Barbie doll had. The first celebrity doll in the Barbie world was Twiggy. In 1966, the model Twiggy personified the look of swigging London. She used the Francie doll body. And the real live model Twiggy actually came to Mattel to sign the license to use her name and likeness. It was fun to see her walk into the design building lobby with her entourage, this tiny petite uh, teenager. British designer Mary Quaint brought a revolution to fashion in the mid-1960s. We were all happy to see the change from styles that were designed as a relief from fashion evolving from World War II. In my book, I show a photo of my white strappy boots that inspired the orange boots on Barbie. Uh, in that photo on your left in 1968. Artist Peter Max worked with Seventeen Magazine showing mod fashions for teenagers. And I still have this issue and enjoy seeing the advertisements as well as the fashion section. I personally feel that the printed magazine should be preserved in its entirety as it offers a complete picture for fashion of the times. Starting with Elvis Presley and then the Beatles and others, a new style of music became popular. Children loved the music and of course, Barbie needed to groove and sing. This was the first venture into play that did not involve the dress undress play pattern. Now children were rocking to the music as records came with the dolls. My friend Judith Brewer Curtis of 60s paper fashion fame later Warner Brothers, where she designed the first Wonder Woman costume, worked at Mattel designing for Barbie at this time. She designed the miniature tie-dye fabric pattern and fashion for Barbie doll, and I designed both PJ's and Christie's fashions. 
Our former Austrian countess, Marlena Little, designed Ken dolls fashion. And incidentally, I personally had a black, long fringed vest just like PJ's. I saved the beach buggy from the trash when Mattel was clearing out their archives boxes from the engineering section. Um, and note the flower is missing from the front wheel. In the early years, models were crude, not refined like computer-aided design produces today. In the late 1960s, there were many beach-themed movies and Sunday newspaper advertisements featuring swim shorts for men. In 1968, I designed swim shorts and a cover-up for the new good-looking male dolls. The Ken doll had a new body and face sculpt, while his black friend Brad was introduced that year. Ken is wearing the basic doll fashion, while Brad and the other Ken are wearing my pack fashions. Marlena Little designed the first pale turquoise Malibu Barbie swimsuit, and I designed the other swimsuits that you're seeing. I love this photo. It took over an hour to set up as the dolls kept falling. They just did not want to sit right. I was disappointed with most of my photos. However, as I climbed the three steps to my back door, I shot this photo. Finally, I had one that I liked. To quote from my book, Barbie and her friend Steffi left not only reflected the fashion of the early 70s, but also the free range designers had for matching accessories to clothing and creating prints that were perfect in size for Barbie. That changed after the oil embargo. We had to design miniature prints for screen printed fabrics during the oil embargo, as other fabrics were either not available or far too expensive to use and we could have um, low quotas uh, for the screen printed fabrics, which was good for the small doll. Glamorous fabrics such as brocades were not available as their looms were used to make fabrics to line the tents of wealthy Arabs during the oil embargo. In 1973, the careers line of fashions began as a statement for women's movement in our Get Ups and Go line and has evolved into a top-selling line of dolls in 2020. Most designers and marketing personnel at Mattel were members of NOW, the National Organization for Women, and wanted to advance the opportunities for girls by suggesting careers or other things in their future. We always stressed education by including a diploma as well as various accessories that lent themselves to what was featured. We raised children's aspirations quietly by suggesting, by giving them ideas, tools, and directions toward what their future might be. And Surgeon Barbie uh, her picture and the doll actually was in the recent exhibit at the Louvre Museum in Paris, and she made uh, the front page of all their advertisements. The oil embargo ended by the mid-1970s, and brocades and other glamour fabrics once again became plentiful. Even Forbes magazine featured a woman in a beautiful gown on the cover with the title Glamour Returns. I designed the promotional superstar Barbie and Ken dolls. Barbie wore a fluffy marabou stole and a silvery cap topping her slim fuchsia and silver knit gown. This is the entrance of the new superstar Barbie and Ken bodies and their new face sculpts. Some say they resemble two popular movie stars of the time, Farrah Fawcett and Robert Redford. You tell me. In 1980, our black designer, Kitty Black Perkins, designed a sophisticated gown for a standalone black Barbie doll. This was the first time that the name Barbie 
was used on an African-American doll. That same year, a Hispanic Barbie doll was created by Janet Goldblatt. However, her gown was more ethnic in design. I competed with these two designers over 20 years for the lead Barbie doll. We each inserted our own strengths and personalities into our designs, finding wide ranges of acceptance. We were friendly competitors. Then, in 1982, at the height of the Afro hairstyle popularity, I designed a sweet yellow dress for Magic Girl Barbie, where, for the first time, an African-American doll named Barbie was included with a Caucasian doll named Barbie also. The following year, 1983, with sales of Barbie in various ethnicities rising, Twirly Curl Barbie came in Caucasian, African American, and Hispanic versions, and they all had the name Barbie. This doll, by the way, brought a great many young men into collecting Barbie dolls, as they favored the long hair and the fashion styling that was similar to that of Halston. And I will quote again from my book. Mattel released Magic Girl Barbie, whose hair could transform from curly to straight and back again via the use of a solution included with the doll. It was also the first time the company had created an African-American doll as part of the Barbie series. In the 1960s, there was Christy and an African-American version of Francie, then a standalone black Barbie doll in 1980. We released the Caucasian and African-American dolls side by side and dressed them in an identical yellow dress I had designed. A peasant style maxi length dress with a touch of lace trim. I chose that soft butter toned yellow largely because it suited both skin tones so beautifully. If you look closely at the feet of Twirly Curls Barbie photo, I think the one in the center, you'll see one of the needles used to position her. I had quite a time getting the three dolls to look as if they were uh, sort of dancing as a rocket might dance. I attended a market research round table of parents in Kansas City, Missouri, in 1979 and was astonished to learn as I sat behind a one-way mirror that the following was occurring. First, Barbie dolls were gifted baby showers. Second, children as young as two years old were given Barbie dolls to play with. This was a time that we had bendy legs covered with a plastic skin that often became sticky. That stickiness did not allow the clothes to easily slide onto the doll. Also, the clothing was really designed for an older age group and did not follow safety rules for children under age three years. Therefore, I outlined what was required for a child of this age to play with Barbie doll and then presented it to my marketing counterpart who was sitting beside me. We were able to get this new doll introduced into the 1980 line as my first Barbie doll. Later, we learned that children had difficulty with shoes and tights uh, for their favored ballerina dolls, the most popular in the My First Line. To achieve a really easy doll to dress, I created a mock-up doll by gluing lace onto the lower torso and painting the legs white. Then, using Sculpey, I sculpted ballet slippers onto the doll, painting them pink. The sculpted panty was added to the entire line of Barbie dolls, thereby solving the problem parents had when underpants did not come with a fashion. As children asked why they needed to wear underpants when Barbie didn't. The popularity of Barbie was increasing by the end of the 1970s. In 1977, the first book on Barbie, titled Barbie, Dolls, and Collectibles, often referred to as the Barbie Encyclopedia, was published, and that brought adult collectors together. 
In 1980, the first National Barbie Doll Collectors Convention was held. The Barbie market was changing. Therefore, we introduced the Dolls of the World collection with three dolls. First in the series, a British princess, a Parisian can-can dancer, and an Italian beauty. And this collection has continued until recently in one form or another. In 1981, Charlotte Johnson, manager of Barbie Design, began showing signs of advanced Alzheimer's disease and retired. This left a void in the design group, as no one was available to take over her travel duties, approving product prior to production and some new design for Asia. I volunteered, and oh, let me tell you, I loved every minute of it. My first assignment was in Japan. Mattel had recently ended the license with Takara Toys after seeing them in company with arch rival Hasbro seeking license for their Care Bears dolls. Mattel joined with Bandai Toys, a boys toy company, to produce the special Barbie doll for the Japanese children. However, the traditions where women and girls were subservient to men became a problem with approvals and fashions. Their male manager would not approve fun, young, kicky, westernized designs uh, for the dolls. The Bandai Toys manager was stuck in tradition and the new Maba Barbie doll was just not selling. I was sent to learn why. I was there for six weeks and suffered culture shock while living in traditional hotels close to what Japanese women experience. My report ended the Mar Barbie doll and soon Mattel embraced one Barbie doll worldwide. And you'll see in the picture, uh, I was asked to design a line for this Maba Barbie doll and present it to uh, the officials at Maba. And I found that the company that was to actually execute make the 3D models uh, could not complete them. So I was forced to borrow a sewing machine and sit in my hotel room nights and make Barbie fashions, but I did it. And uh, while I was there, it seemed like almost every other day there was a holiday and I had lots of fun enjoying the holiday. I made many trips to Asia to approve fabrics for early production and enjoyed seeing our plants in Korea, Taiwan, China, and of course Hong Kong. Then the opportunity arose to move to Hong Kong and open a Barbie design studio. Somehow Mattel had accumulated warehouses full of inactive inventory. There were fantastic stories of how this happened, but none told the real story. I became an expatriate and moved to Hong Kong. And I want to say that I am proud that I'm a citizen of the United States of America, where freedom of the press as well as freedom to express oneself artistically is protected by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. During the time I was in Hong Kong, I saw firsthand what oppression does to people as I traveled throughout China. The 1980s still had British rule in Hong Kong, but China was opening up and changing. It was an exciting time to live in Asia. I hired a staff, one designer and two sample makers, as well as a secretary, who excelled in computer technology. Daily we watched what was happening to the fabrics adopted for the line and my new designs, and found that the 1980s computer technology was not advanced enough to handle the problem. This was easily controlled by a special program invented by a Chinese general manager. When I completed my designs using the warehoused fabric and it was gone, I realized that the fashion influences I was used to simply were not in Asia. I feel fashion stems from that something within the designer. Our backgrounds influence our lives. Therefore, after discussions, I returned to the USA and the Barbie design group once more, this time as both a preliminary conceptual designer and a Barbie doll fashion designer. 
And these are some pictures uh, that I shot while in Hong Kong. Or actually, throughout China. I met a great conceptual artist at Mattel upon my return, and together we formulated a way to realize the dream of Barbie designers at Mattel, and that was to have a byline. Before this, we were a closely guarded secret. The classic collection is the line that we created, and it featured six Barbie designers from 1992 through 1998. I was the first Barbie designer featured in 1992 and was scheduled to have three dolls, but marketing was skeptical about sales and reduced the entry to one doll and two fashions. Well, let me tell you, it sold. And after that, everybody got more dolls and more fashions. The hair featured doll scheduled for the 1992 line was in trouble. Five designers could not get approval for their designs. A feature was still being invented when I was asked to take over the project. I was asked to go into a marketing design review meeting, sell the feature, and state that I would design a fashion for Barbie and you'd like it. I did this and almost immediately learned that the miracle feature would not be finalized. And the reason was tragic. All personnel knowledgeable in the product were killed in a helicopter crash on Mount Fuji. But I was told that a backup company uh, in the state of Georgia in the USA uh, was working with recycled Coke bottles and they would be ready with this hair for Barbie. Not to worry. Well, I worried. I immediately began brainstorming features and came up with dressing her in her hair. Remember, we didn't have a feature. I told my marketing counterpart, and together we planned the doll that became Totally Hair Barbie. And she was uh, the best-selling doll of all time, and I think she still holds the record. The average age of children plagued with Barbie inched lower in the 1990s. Now it was two to four years with children out of Barbie before age five. Although we specified on the package over the age of three, we needed to insert nurturing into the Barbie world. And we couldn't marry Barbie off because that would change the whole play pattern. Therefore, I created a baby sister for Barbie, roughly age two to six, just below the age of Skipper Doll. She entered the market and was loved by both children and adults. She even has her own collector clubs devoted to her. And uh, you can see on the far left, that was the first uh, baby sister Kelly that we produced. But we could not get the name Kelly worldwide. So in Europe and a few other countries, she was known as Shelley. And then when we were able to achieve the name Chelsea worldwide, her name was changed. But it's the same doll. She's my baby. Adults who once played with Barbie doll as a child were now collecting special dolls to display. The collector division began in 1990 and featured Barbie as the star of a movie, or merely the movie star herself, or recreating a specific era, or whatever we could come up with. The collector division had a line of porcelain Barbie dolls uh, dressed in reproductions of fashions from the early years. But uh, the collectors didn't care for porcelain, but then we were able to come up with a special porcelain mix uh, that was part porcelain and part vinyl, and that was created for the Silk Silkstone line of dolls, and, and they came out just after I retired, and as I understand it, they're ending this year. The collector division merged with the play line a short while ago. And today, the vision of Barbie changing as we change has created a totally new play pattern with Barbie dolls of various sizes and ethnicities 
following the projection play pattern where the child fantasizes. So you see they're continuing the same Golden Jubilee Barbie doll was created for her 35th anniversary. The slim gown is fully beaded with a pattern that I created a la modern art when the beads fell off the beaded fabric I was working with. I'd never worked with beaded lace before and did not realize that I had to tie each strand of beading before I cut the gown out. Um, and my new pattern made this gown probably the most expensive ever produced at Mattel. And that was due to that beading pattern all over. I was honored to have my name appear on the back of this doll also. And this is another first in the world of Barbie. And I don't think anyone else has had their name appear actually on a doll since then. This artistic photo was taken of my final design for the Barbie doll to accompany an article by Patricia McLaughlin of the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1998. And I will quote, Jackie Kennedy had Oleg Cassini, Audrey Hepburn had Herbert D. Givenchy, and Barbie had Carol Spencer. Until now, that is. Spencer retires this year as Barbie's chief designer. After 35 and a half years of turning out tiny originals for the world's most voracious couturier customer, she knows things about the Barbster that nobody else does. So naturally, she's planning a tell-all memoir. Dressing Barbie offers many inside stories about designing inside the ivory tower of secrecy. And it offers my personal story of how I persevered for five decades, enjoying the challenges. It gives encouragement to a great many persons. And I copied one letter from a young lady in India for you to see. One day, I think that she will achieve at least a part of her dream. We're still in touch. And this is the letter. Siri was accepted by USC in the fall of 2019, entering classes to become a pharmaceutical scientist. That was her dream. We planned to meet when she got settled. However, she had to put her dream on hold as her mother became quite ill and Siri returned to India. I'm still in touch with her, encouraging her to find new ways to achieve a part of that dream while enjoying quality time with her mother. And we are still in touch. And here's her response from a few days ago. Thank you so much for the kind words, Miss Carol. They're very uplifting. I will work hard to achieve my dreams just like you. Thank you for the inspiration. And I also received a great many messages after the book came out via Facebook, Messenger, and LinkedIn from men and women, young and old. Many poured out their hearts telling me how much they love Barbie doll. One young man said that he wouldn't be the person he is today without his grandmother giving him Barbie dolls. And from one collector in Australia, you had the best job at the best time. I worked in fashion for 25 years, and I admire four designers above all others. Yves Saint Laurent, Coco Chanel, Balenciaga, and you. Well, I don't think I fit in that category. I'm grateful for the many comments I received and look forward to meeting many collectors once COVID-19 is over. I hope that my book, Dressing Barbie, offers many more people inspiration. So if you don't have a copy, enjoy it in the future. Thank you very much. Good night. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Carol. That, that was wonderful. We really enjoyed a walkthrough on the book. And let me say, as a fashion historian, um, I have to say that uh, you have undoubtedly dressed more uh, women and individuals and inspired more than Saint Laurent, Balenciaga, and Coco Chanel combined. <laughs> you were much more approachable. Um, it was something that you, you, you brought the mystery of fashion home to so many youngsters.
So that is a tremendous and tremendous, tremendous point. Um, we have, thank you, uh, we have had almost 350 uh, attendees on this and we've had some fun questions. Um, and first of all, a shout out, I think our, uh, one of our, our furthest guests is uh, from Costa Rica and we have others that have shared memories of dressing Barbie and making clothes for them. And let me see, um, there were a few questions. Um, one of which was, um, is, is there any real difference or what are the differences between uh, dressing Barbie and American Girl dolls? Well, the differences between um, Barbie and American Girl dolls, uh, actually they're, they're vast because it's a different play pattern. Okay. Uh, and it's a different size doll. And right, with, that's... You know, uh, the American Girl doll has a specific uh, image or a specific name, and then they research and they dress her according to that. Whereas with Barbie, we follow trends, we follow what's happening today. And then we go ahead um, and dress her for various uh, occupations or play patterns or various interests. Real quick, could you um, could you explain to our our guest what uh, you mean by the term play pattern? What does it mean? What does it mean to you as as a fashion designer for Barbie? Well, the play pattern is actually how the child uh, will ultimately play with the product. Uh, with computer. You're, you're playing with something on uh, a game or something on the computer and you're clicking something. But with Barbie, you're actually hands-on with her and you're dressing, undressing her or you're imagining something is going to happen or something that you imagine you want to work out in your own mind. Uh, there are so many different ways of doing things. Okay, tremendous. Well, you've mentioned that before, and I thought that might be just an interesting to to make that clear for our our, our viewers. Um, there are some interesting questions. Uh, somebody wants to know about Tootie and Todd, and about Tootie and Todd, about about those two. And I was looking through my book. I'm I'm not sure I know. I'm not sure I can find who are, who are Tootie and Todd. Okay, Tootie and Todd were Barbies. Uh, twin brother and sister in the early years, um, they had a wire armature. Mattel did not have um, recorded the name, so they didn't have it copyrighted or in any way preserved. Uh, and they weren't all that fond of the name, but because it had a wire armature, we had to discontinue those dolls. Um, in the 1970s when the safety laws came about because it was possible that the wire that allowed the child to bend the doll might come through the skin. Wow, okay. Wow, the interesting history about that. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I do, uh, I know this may be the, hard, the most difficult question, uh, but somebody has asked us, what's your favorite? Who is your favorite Barbie? Well, I've been asked that a great many times. And my <laughs> stock and trade answer is the next one I'm about to design, <laughs> I'm not designing them anymore. So I would say any one of the ones behind me are my favorite. <laughs> well, that is quite quite an impressive backdrop, I have to say. It would have been perfect for, uh, perfect for our presentation. I guess one of my last questions that I'm curious about that you touch on just at the very end of your book, um, and it kind of goes to the idea of play. Um, what do you think parents can do now in this virtual age to, uh, to really get kids interested? Or how can kids become interested in Barbie and engage the same way um, they did in previous generations? What are, what are some just things that parents might mention or think about or, um, what would you suggest to keep Barbie uh, on everyone, everyone playing with Barbie instead of a, instead of a phone? <laughs> well, 
Um, the Barbie team has done some wonderful things since I retired. And most recently this year, and that was a favorite, uh, children uh, bought the dolls that, and they were playing um, the election. Uh, they could pretend that the dolls were either going for president, vice president, what have you. Uh, and that was extremely popular. And they also have um, a color reveal doll uh, that's wonderful for you to use. Uh, you open this cartridge that, um, take it out, take the doll out, add water into the cylinder, and then you put the doll in and all of a sudden it reveals what kind of a doll you have. And you're given various clothes to dress. So that, that's been very popular too. It's one of my favorites. Very cool. They're, so they're, they're really working to keep um, Barbie contemporary with, with culture. And she, she is, she's growing, but you set, she's growing, she's changing, but you set the dynamic pattern. <laughs> Absolutely. For well, that. It, it's the trends. It's what's happening. And, you know, so that the child can go on and explore and create their own uh, new ideas with the doll. And one thing that they're finding is with so many computer uh, aided classes and that, uh, the parents want the children to have downtime so they can play with the dolls in the downtime away from the computer screen. <laughs> I think we could all use that these days. <laughs> well, good. That's an that's an, an incredible. Well, finally, I mean, just an, an interesting question that um, it came through is: uh, Has any a mirror image question? Has any fashion designer knocked off your designs that you know of? Have they, have you, have they taken your, your, your designs and, and made them their own? Have you? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any, anyone that has done that. <laughs> Although we go back and forth, but I do have one favorite story from the time uh, was back in the sixties. Yves Saint Laurent was in Los Angeles and he was uh, showing his uh, collection at Perino's restaurant, which is no longer there. And afterwards, I went up and I asked him for his autograph. And he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a Barbie designer. And he said, oh, I look at the Barbie line all the time to see what you're doing. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. that. That's interesting, interesting to hear. And, and to go back to the point, I can assure you dress more women than he has uh, in the form of Barbie. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's really, that's, it's really incredible. Uh, let's see, I think we are coming to the end of, end of our time, but this is just to remind everyone that your, um, uh, book can, can be purchased. We've sent a link at bookshop.org or of course if you have a favorite independent bookseller to, uh, to, to patronize them in, in this time. Um, I know I try to keep, uh, try to keep uh, my independent bookseller friends as busy as, as, busy as I can. <laughs> um, I think we're all interested in that. Um, again, your book was a, a fascinating read just into to pop culture, into fashion. Um, it's it's great to hear that well, <laughs> you you are you are an inspiration, you know, to every everyone from little girls growing up to uh, to Saint Laurent himself. It's a decades book, and uh, Harper Collins has very explicit uh, requirements. We used three hundred and sixty DPI, so the photos wow. are large and clear and sharp in the book. So if you didn't see the full photo in my presentation, buy the book and you will get something absolutely <laughs> wonderful inside. It's very clear. They're very, very, very great portfolio. Well, I guess my final question is what's next for Carol Spencer? Oh, what's next? Um, well, I'm, I'm still promoting my book because my book tour was 
actually stopped by COVID-19. Um, I had 10 trips that were totally canceled. Oh, wow. And it's going on into next year. Uh, so <laughs> this, this is what I'm doing and, you know, just enjoying life. Good I celebrated my 88th birthday a few weeks ago. Congratulations. So I'm kind of stuck at home. <laughs> California has all these COVID restrictions. <laughs> well, yes, they, daily they seem to change, particularly in California. But, well, thank you for spending some time with us. I, uh, in looking at the comments on the chat, it was it really, you brought back a lot of great memories for our, um, our audience and a lot of uh, really exciting, exciting it, it, interesting news and information about Barbie that um, it, I probably very few of us knew. <laughs> so, so thank you again very much for that. And um, on behalf of, of me and the Fashion Committee and the National Arts Club, we we definitely wish you well um, in promoting the book and wherever uh, wherever you go, wherever you choose to go next. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here and talking to everyone today. Ours as well. Thank you very much. Take care, Carol. Thank you. Bye.